Greetings, students. This is a lecture about who was Horace Walpole. Um, this will give you some of the historical context you need about the time period in which this novel was written, which was the mid 1700s or the 18th century. And it'll give you some information about Horace Walpole, who I find to be one of the most ridiculous and fascinating figures from his period in England. I also recently went on a trip to his house in England while on a research trip. So I will show you those pictures. All right, just a review. Got to go back to this. What is Gothic? Um, a lot of you are familiar with goth style. We watched the South Park video. It's funny. Um, reminder about Gothic architecture, um, basically became popular in the Middle Ages and features a lot of ornamentation, like fancy design, dec very overly decorated, um, usually in celebration of God and religion. There's also Gothic font. This is going to come up actually when we begin Castle of Otranto. It's also known as the Black Letter. This is generally used in Germanic languages. Um, in and uh, someone in like the 18th century would recognize that as being something German, um, which is associated with where the Goths are from. Also a reminder of the historical Goths. I'm not gonna go into detail about this, but just the big thing to remember was there were actually people from East Germany, tribes that invaded and caused the fall of the Western Roman Empire in the third, fourth and fifth centuries. A reminder that when we say third, fourth and fifth centuries, Year zero, that's when the modern era or the common era begins, and it's generally associated with the birth of Jesus, which is also going to come up. Um, so that's how we date the common era. It's about 300 af to 500 years after um, Jesus, you can say. That's the time when the Roman Empire was at its peak and was like considered the greatest civilization of all time in the West. Um, whether or not it was, and you're, you know, up for debate. But anyway, in the minds of later people, the Goths were the ones that destroyed this great civilization. So it's associated with like vulgarity and being barbaric and um, against order. Uh, so that's just a review of some old slides. And just a reminder, after the fall of Rome, it led to what later got called the Dark Ages and then the Medieval Period. And then in the 1400s in Europe, we had the Renaissance, which means rebirth from the Dark Ages. Okay, but that's also around the time when Europe began to turn away from Catholicism, which we're going to get to today. All right, a little bit of fun. Who was, Robert, uh, who was Horace Walpole? Here's a picture of him painting... Look how nice. All right, I'll say more about this picture later. So Horace Walpole was born in 1717 and died in 1797, lived a very long life spanning the 18th century. Reminder that when we say 18th, um, we mean the 1700s, right? His father was Robert Walpole, very famous guy, he, because he was the first prime minister of England. Uh, this was a big deal. And um, they were a Protestant family, which was also a big deal. Uh, Protestant religion had only been around for about 200 or so years, so it was relatively new, Pro and we'll get to what that means. Um, Horace Walpole was educated at Cambridge, which is a fancy university in England. The architecture is very Gothic, because it was built in the Middle Ages, or the medieval times. Um, Walpole learned to hate superstition and religion, but he loved the style of churches and royalty. So it's very ironic. Like he hates superstition, he hates religion, but he loves churches. He loves the style and he loved the dignity and sort of ornate beauty associated with the monarchy. Um... Another thing to note, his love life, well, hmm, it's a little con controversial, never got married, 
and he was described by his enemies often as effeminate. And we all know what that kind of insult is supposed to mean. Um, he has no children, had no children, and some speculate he was maybe asexual. There's not a lot of evidence that he had any sexual relationships with anyone, man or woman. Another thing is that his best friend was none other than Thomas Gray. Yes, that Thomas Gray who wrote the Churchyard Elegy that you guys spent so much time pondering. That's his best friend. And they kind of had a falling out because um, they, would, they would go on vacation together to Europe, to Western Europe. And um, Gray wanted to like hang out at old sites and ponder death and Walpole wanted to like go out and party so they they kind of fell off but there's lots of letters written between the two of them and journals and all in all it's a very uh great 18th century friendship okay so ha huh, there's me I'm standing in front of his house oops that's his house um, I give you a link here. You can click and there's a little tour you can take of um, Strawberry Hill, an interior tour. You can go room to room. And the reason this is interesting to do is because his house gives us a lot of information about um, his style. And his style is just the entire substance of Castle of Otranto. I mean, Castle of Otranto is the first Gothic novel, and this was written by a man. He invented the Gothic novel, and he was obsessed with the Gothic. Remember, this was not the ti this is not the style of his own time period. This is him taking a house and renovating it to make it look like a Gothic church slash castle. This is all him trying to make it look old and goofy. You'll see what I mean in a minute. So I visited it. There's a selfie in portrait mode. I'm looking deep. This is where it's located. This is England right here. This is Wales. Up here is Scotland. Over here is Ireland and Northern Ireland. Um, London, it's very close to London. It's like a 40 minute long train ride. And there's, this is Twickenham. So he moved into this house in 1747. It's called Straw Hill. He changed the name to Strawberry Hill because... Well, it was cuter. All right, there it is. Notice it looks like a church plus castle. All right, this is going to be just a reminder of European history in case you forgot or never learned it. You don't have to memorize all this, but it gives you a helpful context for the book we're going to read, which actually doesn't even take place in the 18th century. It's supposed to take place in olden times. We'll get to that in another lecture. But anyway, overview of European history, just the big hits to give you context for Walpole's time. So we start with Jesus, okay? Helpful starting point because that's year zero. You know, Christmas, Jesus is born. That's, we in history date that as year zero of the common era. Before year zero is BC, before Christ. That's what we called it when I was young. Now it's BCE, before Common Era. Um, it's a reminder that not everyone is Christian, and um, some of us grew up with this, some of us did not. So it's good for us to all be on the same page. But anyway, Jesus, think of him born around year zero. He died ages like 30 to 36. Um, so when he died, his disciples founded the church, right? And that church was Christianity, and the very first major church that came out of Jesus' death was the Roman, well, was the Catholic Church and the Roman Catholic Church. So Catholicism is like the original Christianity. Uh, it's really interesting to know that, major world religion. So for about, you know, a thousand plus, a thousand plus five hundred years, fifteen hundred years, when you were Christian, you were probably Catholic of some kind. And um, it wasn't until 1517 when all this sort of split apart. So if you're a Christian, but you're not Catholic, you're not Roman Catholic, if you're a Protestant, like you're Baptist or Methodist or Lutheran, Presbyterian, Anglican, um, Quaker, anyway, any of those, 
It's because of this. It's because in 1517, a man named Martin Luther, this is who Martin Luther King Jr. was named after, Martin Luther wrote what's called the 95 Theses about, remember thesis statements? This is 95 arguments about why and how the Catholic Church was corrupt. And it was, it was very corrupt. You could basically like pay to get out of your sins. If you were rich, you could pay and they would tell you that you were going to heaven faster. Um, so he thought this was corrupt. He wrote these 95 arguments, posted them on the wall of a church, on the door of a church. He got in big trouble, but that's when the big split happened between Catholicism and Protestantism. Protestant has the word protest in it, right? So that's where we get Protestantism. So if you're anything other than Catholic, like you're evangelical, you're like regular degular Christian, that's because of this guy, Martin Luther one of the major figures of history. Um, and his major argument was you shouldn't be able to pay to get out of your sins, all right? So fast forward a few years, we're in England now. So Martin Luther was German, by the way. In England, we had this king, King Henry VIII. Many of you have heard of him. Henry VIII, I am, I am. Henry VIII, I am. I was married to the woman next door. Something, 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 song my dad used to sing. Anyway, Henry VIII um, was married to this woman, Catherine. Here she is. These are his six wives, by the way. He was married to this woman, Catherine. She was Catholic. She was from Spain. Um, and she, uh, her parents were very famous at Isabel and Ferdinand. They were at the center of the... Um, they uh, burned a lot of people, tortured a lot of heretics. Anyway, he no longer wanted to be married to her and um, because he fell in love with this young woman who was hot, named Anne Boleyn. There's a lot of TV shows and movies about this. Um, so he found a way. He was like, well, if I'm, so Catholics can't get divorced, but Protestants can, and I want to get divorced. So I'm going to not only become a Protestant, I'm going to make myself head of the church. And until that point, the head of the church, the, and still to this day, the head of the Catholic Church is the Pope. So Henry VIII de decided he was head of, of English, England and also head of the church, and they split from the Catholic Church in Rome simply because he wanted to divorce his wife and marry a hot young lady, and Catholics weren't allowed to get divorced. So, so by the way, Henry's child with Catherine here, um, Catherine of Aragon, his child with her was named Mary, um, and then, uh, she was also known as Bloody Mary, right? And then, uh, or Mary Tudor. And then his daughter with Anne was named Elizabeth, who le later became Elizabeth I. And Elizabeth I had Mary beheaded later. Elizabeth I... So there's a lot of movies about her. She had red hair, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And as you know, like Anne Boleyn, this woman got beheaded. Then he married this woman. And then, you know, these he had a lot of wives. And it was pretty grim. There's a lot of fun books about it. All right. Moving on from Henry. You could spend all year on Henry. So as you can imagine, like declaring himself head of the church and like separating England from... 1500 years of Catholicism didn't go over well with everyone. Um, he was destroying a lot of the monasteries and the churches. So, you know, when later people look back to this period, people like Walpole were really sad because beautiful architecture from the Middle Ages got destroyed because Henry VIII decided to quit the church and start his own. Um, so in the 17th century, there was a lot of conflict. There were English civil wars. Um, and there was a really big uh, conflict between monarchy, absolute monarchy, and democracy. And this led to the execution of King Charles I in 1649, and the establishment of Parliament, which is like our Congress in the United States. Um, but then in 1688, there was what's called the Glorious Revolution, and they returned to the monarchy but they also added a prime minister and made Protestantism as the main religion. So there's a lot of back and forth 
with the kings and queens between Catholicism and Church of England or Anglicanism, which was Protestant. Um, and that conflict remains to this day. I mean, if you've heard about the tr troubles in Ireland um, all through the 20th century up to today, you know, the problem is that Ireland is largely Catholic and England over the years has always tried to occupy and then uh, occupy Ireland and send the Protestants there and take over and that's why there's Northern Ireland and so forth. So that's the origin of all of that conflict. This all continues up to today. All right, so that's the sort of background history. Now let's go to the historical context of Walpole's time. So Walpole himself, so his father was a prime minister. He was from a very elite family. He himself was in parliament for almost 30 years and this was during a time of great upheaval in the country. This was the time during the Jacobite uprising. Um, this was a lot of conflict between the English in the south and the Scots in the north, who at various times wanted to be free from the English. Um, and that actually, that tension continues to this day. And if you want some historical background slash uh, naughty sex scenes, you can watch Outlander, which is a really fun show on um, stars, I believe. This is Jamie, uh, lots of kilts, lots of sex. There's time travel, um, but there's a lot of wars, battles, most of which are accurate. Great show, somewhat accurate. Anyway, but that's the time period when Walpole was in parliament and his greatest fear was the rise of absolute monarchy again. So he's part of parliament, he's in charge of voting for bills, but if a monarch were to take over, uh, that would be bad, you know. They feared that, and this is important to reading Castle Votranto because Walpole really hates authoritarian rulers. You'll see in Castle Votranto there's a very nasty ruler. Um, I don't want to give anything away, but this is like the main, the main fear dominating this text. So... And uh, continue with the context, end of the 18th century, so the end of Walpole's life, um, 1700s, 18th century is 1700s, there was a lot of revolution and unrest in France. As you know, that was the time of the French Revolution. England was under threat from France. They felt like it was the end times in England. People really feared that they were going to be taken over by the French. Um, English and French have a long history of animosity. And there's a fear that they would really lose their history, their, you know, old architecture, their their legacy. Um, so there's this sort of ironic tension throughout everything Walpole does in his life. He really hated kings. He hated authoritarian rule. He really hated Catholicism, but he loved that style and he loved um, history. So his house, even though he's very anti-monarchy, anti-Catholic, his house looks like a church. And it's got, it's filled with things like this. This is a picture I took. Pictures of all the English monarchs and kings and queens and relics, literal, actual relics of those monarchs. So um, if you think this is self-contradictory, it is. And he's a weird guy. No doubt about that. Uh, how did this historical context influence Walpole? So he hated, he hated anything that destroyed beauty, right? Now, he didn't like Catholicism, but he also hated anti-Catholic Reformation and civil wars. Why? Because wars and Reformation had ruined things that he felt were in good taste. So in the, um, uh, and this is six, uh, 24 in Roman numeral of your copy of Castle of Otranto, he writes about how he hate, like, he writes about the dis that destruction of ancient monuments and Gothic piles and painted glass. This is something he really mourns. He hates whenever churches get destroyed. And he saw Gothic style as a species of modern elegance. He really believed that the Gothic was the most elegant, truly beautiful architectural and artistic style. And this is a picture of, um, well, his living room, basically. It was like an art gallery he built in his house. And this is ceiling made to look like the ceiling of a cathedral painted gold. This is actually not carved stone. It was made from paper mache. We'll get to this in a minute. Okay, so you understand there's this irony. On one hand, he hates kings, he hates church, but he also 
hates the things that destroy those as well. So we'll move on from here. I want to take you on a little tour of his house, my visit back in August. This is a specially curated tour for you. So this is the entrance. This is Strawberry Hill. The beautiful day I visited with my friend. I got my finger in the way, but you can see it looks like a church and a castle, but it's just his house. There's yours truly, just hanging out at Walpole's house, just leaning on the wall. Um, and I want you to really look at this and come back to these pictures later because, um, you know, this will give you a, an appreciation for the book we read um, and the, the style that he was looking at while he was writing it. He wrote the book while he was in this house. So that's me, um, pregnant, by the way, I'm pregnant, uh, starting to show in these pictures. So that's exciting. That's the look. Horace Walpole, man of letters, lived here. Yeah, no kidding. Um, this was at the entrance. The tour guide told me he he put this statue here to make it look like a monk and that he as if he lived in a monastery. You know, it looks like a little thing in a church. Um, he actually found this statue and it was supposed to be an angel, but he tore off the wings because he wanted it to be a monk. So everything in this house was designed and cultivated to make it look like a weird church. So this is the entrance. This is where his guests would come in. This is my friend. Um, and then this is one of the tour guides. The whole place is filled with tour guides. I mean, they just know everything. So it looks like you're entering a church, but that's his house. Um, here's a little video. Camp at the time. So yeah, he was sort of inventing that. Yeah, yeah. and the gloomy walls he was. Okay, so... This is his in the interior of his entrance way when his get so he had it painted the walls painted to look like a particular church, um, a tomb of a famous bishop actually. It's made to look like you're entering a tomb in a cathedral, and what the tour guide was talking about was um, he he had this style he called Glumpf, G L O O M T H Glumpf. It was a combination of gloominess and warmth. That's what that's the style he wanted in his house. He wanted to be gloomy but warm, like gloomy but cozy. Uh, it's this is weird. Okay. So these are his stained glass windows. It was unfashionable to have this type of glass in your house, so it was on sale a lot. And when there's a blank, it doesn't mean we. Okay, so he's saying like this was actually out of style this style of like old um, church windows, stained glass it was out of style in, in Walpole's time. So he was able to find all these stained glass windows. A lot of these actually came from Belgium and stuff. Um, and he built his, he's built them into his own windows, you know, cause he liked, it looked like church. So he designed all of this. So beautiful. Very, I mean, it's goofy too. This is all very strange. Like, what? what is this? This is like a bird eating a dead something on the road, you know? It's, Welcome to my house. There's a lot of birds everywhere. Okay, this is cool. He designed these chairs. They put pine cones on them so you don't sit on them. He designed these chairs, and listen to what the tour guide says. Never put them back against the wall because in the candlelight, Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh. And he's known to have said, regarding these chairs, I have twice the Gothic. That's okay, so he's so he designed these so that in the candlelight, it looks like you're in a church, and the shadows are also Gothic. So, and he said to he said, with these chairs, I have twice the Gothic. So, like this is Gothic, and the shadows are Gothic. Woo! You can see he's obsessed. Look, I mean, they're cool, right? These are very, very precious chairs. They're just so cool. And you and you weren't allowed to put them against the wall because then you wouldn't get the shadows. That was the rule in the house. This is his um, dining room. And it's funny because this is, it's covered in paintings. This whole house is like a gallery. This is a painting of his mother and he looks a lot like her. It's a very beautiful painting. And then on the other side of that same wall is a painting of his father's mistress. So his father's wife on one side, father's mistress on the other, you know, um, 
that was what was going on back then. Well, I guess it still goes on today. Um, just some stuff I took pictures of. Okay, this is a hilarious picture, too. So he had this painting uh, done, I think, by Sir Joshua Reynolds. I have to check. But this is a painting he commissioned of his three nieces. Now listen, Uncle Walpole, this is like Tinder for uh, the 1700s. This is very silly. His three nieces were single, and he wanted to get them husbands. So he had the most famous painter of the time paint this, this picture of them and had it put up at this famous gallery in London. So, like, his, his nieces... Um, would be uh, showcased as available. This this niece got kind of uh, shafted, I think, because look, it was just, it was like a chin shot, so that kind of sucks. Um, but as you can see, the style then was they would make their hair really big and powder it gray, and then they'd wear this like very heavy white paint on their faces. And just like today in all those YouTube tutorials, uh, heavy eyebrows, um, but this was, you know, you can imagine this was the makeup style and these were very fancy young women. And actually, apparently this painting worked like they saw it. Um, men saw it and all three women got married, even the, um, unflattering chin posed one. So that, that's good old uncle Walpole, um, coming through for his single young unmarried nieces. Um, skipping ahead. Just this is more of the ornate style. Now this is the room where he wrote Castle of Otranto. I just wanted to like give you a taste. Green wallpaper. Look at the beautiful church-like windows. Um, close up of the wallpaper. You know there would have been furniture. All of this, got, all this furniture got sold in the 19th century. Unfortunately, they got a lot of it back, but. All the walls would have been covered with paintings at when he wrote, but this is a room where he wrote Castle of Otranto. Pretty cool. There's a selfie in the room where he wrote Castle of Otranto. All right, now, as they say in MTV Cribs back in the day, this is where the magic did not happen. This is Walpole's bedroom. Um, just like everyone, I'm sure he had a picture of his mom and dad staring at him from the bed. And there is his best friend on the wall. And who is his best friend? Thomas Gray. There's Thomas Gray, Churchyard Elegy. That's him, right? This is the painting right here. Thomas Gray is on his bedroom wall. This is more stained glass in his bedroom, more weird birds everywhere. His parents, some doggies. And there's a self-portrait, or not self-portrait, that's a painting of Walpole hanging in his bedroom. There's Walpole again. It's sort of like how some of us have selfies as our screens for our phones. You know, he has his own picture hanging in his bedroom. Okay, now this is the armory. This will become a lot more relevant later on as you read Castle of Otranto. Look how cool that is. This is so you climb up these stairs and you get to this um, this uh, knight's armor. And keep this, remember this image when you start reading because there's a, a big helmet in the first scene of the book. And this is like the helmet from Walpole's house. Um, and remember the black sable plumes. These are black, is another word, sable, and plume means feather. And that's also mentioned in the book. So he was really into medieval stuff, so he collected it. Um, so keep this image in mind, and I'll remind you of it later. Okay, there's me. So here's a painting. A this is a Renaissance painting, and I, I just learned this fun fact. So that's why I took this picture. In Renaissance art, or Renaissance times, um, when royal people would get married, they would often, like, get pregnant before marriage in order to prove that the woman was fertile before the man committed. So a lot of Renaissance um, dresses it was stylish to actually look kind of pregnant because it made sure it made people think you were fertile. So here's a, a wedding. And, um, I like that cause I was starting to show a little bit and I thought it was funny. Um, and that's me. Like, uh, I got so excited seeing the armor because it reminded me of Castle of Otranto that I swear that was the first time my baby kicked. I, I'm not sure if that's true or not. But anyway, 
Okay, this is Walpole's library. These are his, well, these might not have actually been his books. They probably sold off his books, but this is what that kind of library, his library looks like. You know, it looks like a church, right? He loves the church style, hates the actual church. So this is just some more pictures. This is his view. He loves his view. Some more design around here. Some, you could, you could try on costumes. I didn't bother. He also had a printing press at Strawberry Hill. They printed a lot of books. Um, these are some of the letters, like they insert into the press. And then you know, this is the design of a cover page. There's more letters. Okay, more medieval style uh, windows. This is looking out the window. There's a view. It looks like a medieval church area. There's some more pictures of the interior, selfie in a mirror, more medieval gothic looking stuff. Here's his gallery. You saw this before. Actually, fun fact, well, not so fun fact, during World War II, a bomb landed right here where this woman is standing. And fortunately, it didn't go off. It was one, it was a kind in World War II that would drop and then, and then explode as soon as like, um, medics would arrive and as soon as like help would come but this one fortunately did not explode if it had we wouldn't have this building um one had landed down the street and did explode and destroyed the buildings there so actually we're very lucky this building still exists look at that Ooh, look at that ceiling and more uh, this is a different room this is where this was sort of like the chapel of the house of course he didn't worship so it was just like more for displaying items um it's just really pretty he had this is not at the house but he had this display case with little tiny things and it, i was reading the list and this is so ridiculous it had a lock of mary tudor's red hair so that's henry's sister spent in a specially designed locket and also a stuffed mouse that had apparently run over queen caroline's foot you can read all the lock of hair cut from the corpse of Edward the Fourth. So this is this this is stuff Walpole collected. Very weird, but um, tells you about him. He was obsessed with the monarchy, but he hated monarchs. Um, this is more from that chapel. Just very beautiful. It's very ornate. This is a very famous uh, fireplace. I can't remember why. And this is in the chapel. These are all. Uh, monarchs of England and their seals. So again, a reminder, like he really hated monarchy, but he loved the kings. And it was designed to do this, like in the sun, you get these beautiful shadows. See, look at that. Look at that. This is a famous fireplace also. All right, now we're outside again. We're leaving, and here's a staircase with some beautiful gargoyles. Um, I like them, although this dog, or whatever it is, looks like he's hungry. So kind of want to feed them. But that's it. That's Strawberry Hill, the gardens. Oh, here. As one has a satisfaction in imprinting the gloom of abbeys and cathedrals on one's house. So he's imprinting this gloomy warmth of abbeys and cathedrals. These are places of Catholic worship and residence. One's garden, on the contrary, is to be nothing but rant, riant, and the gaiety of nature. I don't know what riant means. Probably ple like laughter and joy. Um, and there we have it. That's the selfie. So I hope you enjoyed this. Sorry I went on too long. Hope you um, uh, will be able to use the imagery that you saw in these slides to help create... Otranto in your heads.